Directly across the street from the illustrious Howard University, HU. No, no. I need, I need better than that. HU. <laughs> you you know. know. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Tonight we have a very special guest with us, uh, Brittany Silla Libre. She has written this amazing etymology book. First of all, I'm trying to not give you the books there, but <laughs> let's, let's ignore that. Uh, <laughs> First of all, look at this book, y'all. Just do you see how thick this is? Yeah. She, you're about to learn something. It's deep. In this book. Like, do y'all <laughs> understand yes. etymology? Because you're about to. <laughs> you're gonna learn today. Like <laughs> tonight, right, right now. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, let me let Brittany talk to y'all about this amazing book, Etymology Rules. Thank you, Thank you Brittany. <laughs> All right, everybody. So, as Christina said, I'm Brittany Salali Bay. Um, my students call me Miss Lee Bay, but you don't have to. Um, and yes, my book is Etymology Rules Back to Basics, and I'll show it one more time. Um, it is a workbook. So, if you get the book, you are expected to do the work. There are exercises in the book, um, but there's also an answer key, so you can check as you go. And um, I want to first ask, I would assume because we're all here, but uh, does anyone here know what etymology is? Anyone want to share? It's the study of the origin of words. It is the study of the origin of words. Thank you, sis. Um, it literally, the word etymology literally means true, the true sense of words, because etymon comes from the Greek meaning true, and then ology. It's like the study of, but even that breaks down to words. So it's the true sense of words, what words meant when they were first uttered. And I wrote this book for multiple reasons, but the main one is because um, I am passionate about language and literacy. And I am a teacher here in DC. I teach middle school, um, which is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> Uh, I always tell people that, um, well, people are like, how could you teach middle school? Because it's crazy. And I'm like, well, I'm crazy too. So it works. Um, and in particular, I'm a reading specialist. So I work with students who, oh, well, I do everything from work with students who struggle to read um, to work with teachers to build reading programs. I coach. Um, I develop professional development. So I'm all things literacy. Um, I also love reading. I have a pretty extensive library. I love um, literature, novels. I write creatively. Um, so I'm just like very much so immersed in the world of words, language, and literacy. So it's something that's important to me. I'm passionate about it. But I recognize that everybody does not have um, the same skill and even love for literacy the way I do. So. Um, you know, the way the book is organized, it starts off with the first chapter. It's called A Note About Reading. And um, I start off sharing some stats. I'm not going to read from the book because the stats uh, were from probably maybe like three or four years ago when I first published it. But um, I want to share some updated stats with you. And hopefully it can express how or why this book is really critical. So in 2022, um, has anyone ever heard of NAEP, N-A-E-P? Mm -hmm. A couple heads nodding yes. So it's a National Assessment for Educational Progress. So when you think of like standardized tests, think of NAEP. And so um, the first NAEP since the pandemic was in 2022, spring of 2022, and the results showed that 33% of students in the fourth and eighth grade cannot read at the basic level. I'm just going to say that again. 33% of students in America in fourth and eighth grade cannot read at the basic level. 
And Nate actually is only tested at fourth and eighth grade. So that's why those stats are for those two grade levels. But anybody who's on social media may have come across like all the TikToks and all the reels of teachers saying, you know, I teach seventh graders, but they read on you know, the fourth grade reading level. I mean, it's very true. Um, I see it with my own eyes. So to me, that's very disheartening. I remember being in kindergarten and just being a very avid and strong reader. And so to hear that there are students in middle school and up who, who don't have access to literature in the same way, it breaks my heart. So that's kind of what pushed me to be a reading specialist. Um, additionally, the, 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 the stat that I just quoted, it spans from low income to wealthy, from the low income to the wealthy in all racial groups. But in particular, it affects our children, black and brown children the most, where 56% um, of uh, African-American students read below basic and 50% of Hispanic students read below basic, according to that test. So you say to yourself, well, how could this be? And you know, a lot of times people like to put the blame on parents. And I say, you know, our job as educators is to educate who's in front of us. It doesn't matter what their circumstances, what their background is, our job is to teach them. And so we need to be equipped. Um, I myself have gone through two master's programs for education, and um, it was only the second one that actually taught about language and, and how to teach children how to read, which is very sad to think that many teachers are in the classroom and don't get proper training on how to teach children how to read, let alone proper training on language. And so I really wrote the book for parents and for teachers to be able to be what I like to call word connoisseurs so that they can build word consciousness. And research shows that um, children who are word consciousness, who are curious about words, who think about words, who ask questions. You know, I've had students who like, oh, where does this word come from? And why do we spell a word this way? Um, that's being word conscious. That means you're really attuned to the words in front of you. And it helps you to build vocabulary. And in order for teachers to foster that in children, I believe they have to be masters of language. So that is the reason why I wrote the book. And so, um, as I said, the first chapter is about reading. Um, why is literacy important? I mean, I think it's quite obvious to probably many of us, the fact that we're sitting here in a bookstore, obviously we know, right? But, you know, Students ask me that all the time, especially because we have YouTube, you know, you can go to TikTok University and like learn anything you want. I get kids tell me all the time, oh, I'll just, you know, I'll just look it up online. I'll watch a video about it. Um, so, but despite technological advancement, literacy is important because it gives us access to information beyond what people have put out via video. And when you can read something, that means you're not just passively absorbing what you watch or what you see, but you are able to read and stop and think critically. You can say to yourself, well, I agree with this, I disagree, and this is why. So it's important to have multiple means of acquiring information and multiple means of communicating. You know, the four ways that we communicate, we listen and we speak, but we also read and we write. And so literacy, despite all of, despite AI, despite all the things that are here that make it easier for us to get information, I mean, literacy is still number one because if it's not on YouTube, if it's not on a video, how are you gonna get it? I have one student say to me, because um, audiobooks is a thing too, right? And I am just wanna say, I'm not against audiobooks by any means. Um, I just think it's how we use them. And so a lot of kids will like, instead of reading the book, they'll listen to the audio and they won't even have the book in front of them and they'll just listen to the audio. But they just kind of listen passively and they don't stop and process and think and ask questions. So I had a student who was in sixth grade. Um, she's actually about to graduate now. And she said, I'll never forget, she said to me, well, I want to be a doctor, but I don't like to read. I said, well, how are you going to read the books when you go to medical school? She said, oh, well, I'll just get the audio book. I said, oh, I'm sorry, baby, I don't think that's the thing. So, you know, um, 
despite, again, like I said, the technology, we still need to be able to read. Um, and also, reading also helps us to develop our vocabulary. And vocabulary is important for us to be able to communicate with clarity and precision. If you want to find that just right word that really conveys what you're trying to say. And it's necessary even to navigate these digital spaces. In fact, I think it's, I think, you know, when you go online and you look at something, you have to have a special skill to be able to read things online because think about it, when you're on a website and then you read something and then there's a hyperlink to learn more about something and then you jump into that hyperlink and then you're reading and then it takes you somewhere else, you know, it, that's all literacy and it all requires a special mind to be able to do that. So even though we have everything online, you still you got to be able to read even more so than you had been before. You have to be able to read even more so than you had to have been in prior times. And then most importantly, um, one of my two of my favorite quotes, um, one of them is reading and writing are emancipatory acts. Um, that's by Linda Christensen, who she wrote a book about teaching literacy. And then once you learn to read, you will finally be free. Frederick Douglass, and we all we all know the story of Frederick Douglass. If you don't, you know, Black History Month, you will read about it. But you know, Frederick Douglass was able to get his freedom through literacy. He literally wrote his own papers, his own freedom papers that he forged. If he did not have the ability to write, who knows what his future would have been. So um, literacy is very important for all of those reasons. Um, reading still, I'm gonna stay on reading and then we're gonna jump to more about language. But um, one of the reasons why a lot of students have been reading poorly, not just because of the pandemic, but also, did you know we've been teaching reading incorrectly for the past 20 years in this country? So raise your hand if you, when you were younger, you remember learning how to sound out words. You remember learning phonics. Like I distinctly remember that, right? Okay. Um, there are children who did not learn phonics. They learned to read, but they didn't learn phonics. Right. I'm, I'm saying the same thing, like how, sway, how, right? Um, and it's through this a method called whole language. And whole language advocates we want children to love reading. We want them to understand what they read, but it's not as important that they decode reading or decode text. Decode meaning break down a word, sound a word out. And so there were two um, advocates of this whole language method. One, well, there are technically three, but there are two who are a pair called Fontes and Pinnell. And so if you've ever heard of F and P readers, or if you have children and you've heard of level readers and you're like, I'm on level J, I'm on level L, et cetera. That's whole language. Um, they even say in their program, if the, child, if the child cannot sound out the words, don't worry about it. They learn to memorize words. They, words become sight words. Well, you can't, there's so many words in the English language and we're, we're adding words to our lexicon, right? So how can you memorize? How can you possibly memorize every single word when more words are continuously being added. Um, so that's one problem. And uh, the, other, the other person who advocated whole language was Lucy Calkins up in Teachers College. And all three of these women made like millions of dollars off of our children um, not teaching them the proper way. Um, if you want to learn more about that, there's a great podcast about Soul to Story. It's a six episode podcast. Oh my gosh. I was listening to it just angry. I mean, I knew all the stuff already, but I was listening to it very angry, um, knowing this woman, these women made so much money. And so now it's emerged as what they call the science of reading, which is so funny to me because they act like it's something new, but it's been around forever and a day. Um, but the science of reading now acknowledges that phonics is necessary for children to be able to read. And so the book, addresses that as well. It teaches about phonemes, graphemes, syllables, word parts, prefix, root, suffix, how to put those together, how to find word derivations. Again, we don't learn that in college. Teachers are not even learning that in college. So that's what this textbook is for. Um, but going into the science of reading, um, the National Reading Panel came out with a study about 23 years ago. 
and they identified the following areas are critical to build strong readers. The first is phonemic awareness. Second is phonics, as we just talked about. Fluency, that's the ability to be able to read fluently, so it's not choppy, it's not too slow, because when you read slowly or when your reading is very choppy, then you cannot put mental energy towards making meaning or comprehending the text. Next is vocabulary, and then last is text comprehension, which is the whole purpose of children reading. And like I said, this has been around for 23 years, and science of reading is now acting like this is a new thing. Um, and so phonemic awareness, in particular, is what we want for beginning, beginning readers to really build. And that's the ability to hear, identify, and manipulate sounds and words. Um, and there are various aspects of phonemic awareness, but I'm gonna do a little exercise with y'all. Um, and again, this is in the text. So if I give you the word dog, right? If I say, I want you to isolate the medial sound, which is the middle sound, what would that be? Ah, uh, right? Okay. I want you to substitute the medial sound for it, what would the word be? Good. 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 I want you to blend the following. M, mm, a, ah, t, math. All right now. Are you a teacher? I was. Okay. <laughs> I felt the vibe. <laughs> um, so those are just some exercises of phonemic awareness that a child needs to have before they even begin reading. Like we haven't even shown them the words. We're just talking about listening to words and being able to uh, manipulate, pick out, and substitute sounds, okay? So that's very critical, again, covered in the book, right? And so all of that said, going now into, that was like chapter one of the book, going now into the rest of the text, um, the way it's organized is we cover phonemes. So, this is where etymology can be helpful because let's say you don't know the meaning of a word. Let's say you didn't know phony, right? What does it, it what does it sound like? Does it sound like another word that you already know? Phone, right? So then phoneme, if you know what a phone is, right? A phone is something that you speak with, but you also, if I'm, if I'm speaking, then you are listening, sound. What other words do you know that have phone, P-H-O-N-E in it? Homophones. Homophones, yep. Yeah. I love teaching homophones. <laughs> Y'all know what homophones are? Yes. Yeah, like there, there, and there. I always see people um, on social media and they're like, she used the wrong there, and, you know. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Homophones, two, two, and two. I saw that today in an event. Okay, and I was like, I don't even know. <laughs> right. The wrong I'm right. Um, another phone word, anybody? Right. Well, that has the word phone in it. Xylophone. Xylophone, right? You listen to the xylophone being played. Megaphone to amplify your voice so you can hear, right? So phoneme has to do with sound. In fact, it's the smallest sound unit of sound in a word. So when I was talking about mat, m at those are phonemes. So mat, how many phonemes is in the word mat? Three. Mm -hmm. How about in the word mash? Three. Three as well. All right. So now let's talk about graphemes. Well, grapheme has what in it that sounds familiar? Graph. Graph. Okay. Think of other words with graph. Graphic. Telegraph. Yeah, y'all didn't know y'all was coming to school today. <laughs> Autograph, paragraph, all these words have to do with what? Pictures. Say it again. Measurement? Uh, no, no, no. Not necessarily it's measurement. Right. Writing. Writing, there you go, right? Your autograph is your yourself, auto self writing, it's your signature. A paragraph is a body of writing. Photograph. Photograph is literally, photo is light, and graph is writing, so it literally is like 
um, drawing by light. So the idea is that the picture is created by light drawing the, the picture. Um, so a grapheme is a fancy way of saying a letter. So we said mat. How many graphemes are a mat? Three. And we said there are three phonemes, right? Okay. Mash, we said there are three phonemes. How many graphemes? Well, how does that work? How are there four graphemes but three phonemes? Oh, <laughs> she want to be the co. <laughs> yeah, it's called a digraph. So the letters SH, that makes one sound. That's called a digraph. There are other ones like CH and PH and TH. Another one, CK. That's also like if you say black or track or stick, those uh, the CK there, that's also a digraph. So this is all a part of teaching phonics, right? Because phonics, the phonics system, when you learn phonics, is really learning to map the phonemes onto the graphemes. So this is really important, and that's why I said this is for teachers and parents, because um, one time I was doing an assessment virtually, um, and so the parent was helping, wasn't supposed to be helping. It was helping, and um, I said, here's the word, I showed them mash, and the kid was struggling to sound it out, and then the parent was like, it's easy. What sound does N make? What sound does S? A make? What about S? What about H? And so you know he fumbled. He was like, mass. <laughs> wow, okay, that sounds bad. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, parents, I, they need to understand as well in order to help their children at home, because this is a group effort. It's collaborative. That's why I said, I don't believe that, that when you send your kid to school, we are responsible, but then they go home and then you are also teaching. So. We got to be on the same page and we got to know this information, both of us. So that's phonics in a nutshell. Um, then it goes into things like, well, how do I know that the A says A ah, instead of A? There's rules to that. I was just teaching, I have a, this is one of the saddest cases I've had in a while, but I have a fifth grader and he reads on a pre-K level. Um, but he's just, the, he's just the most joyous student I probably have ever had. Um, he works very hard, but we got a long way to go, obviously. Um, and right now we're working on short vowel sounds um, like cat and rash and comparing those to long vowel sounds. And there are different patterns that create that long vowel sound. So one of them that we're working on, we call it magic E, but it's just a silent E. It's called the CBCE pattern. That is, you have a vowel consonant, well, if it starts with a consonant, consonant, vowel, consonant, and then a silent E at the end. And that silent E is an indicator that the vowel is going to say its name. It's going to be long. So you have the word man, for example. But if I add an E to the end, what's the word? Man. Mm, see how the vowel changes then? Yes. These are not things that are intuitive to children. They must be taught. So that's really why phonics is critical. Uh, going back to the phonemes, if I have, so main, we are talking about homophones. Main, M-A-N-E. What kind of main is that? Like a lion's main. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the other main, like M-A-I-N. How many phonemes are in that word then? Main? Three. Three. How many graphemes? Four. Yep, so there you go. You have what's called a vowel team, A and I coming together to make one sound. So all these rules, so many rules, and children have to learn the rules, and then they have to apply them and understand what they're reading. Reading is a lot. It's, 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 a, it's a very heavy cognitive activity, but it also can strengthen your cognition as well. Um, so then you go from learning phonics, then you go to what they call advanced phonics, where you're dividing a word into syllables. You have things like open versus closed syllables. Like if I say, um, like, y'all remember Winnie the Pooh? And, no, you don't remember? Yeah, 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 oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Somebody in the back was shaking their head. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't look at Winnie the Pooh. 
but you knew who it was. Oh, I knew. Okay, oh, that's all I needed. Um, so Tigger, right? Mm. How do I spell that? T I G G. Two G's, right? Versus Tiger, one. And the reason why is because you slip between those two G's, and the first syllable is called a closed syllable. And that's why it's short. But the second one, T, the second word, tiger, the first syllable is open, and that's why it's long. And there's so many other syllable rules, but you got to learn those two to read multisyllabic words. What do you think multisyllabic means? Multisyllable? More than one syllable. Multi meaning more than one, right? Like you take your multivitamin every morning if you're my age. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, oh, there's a question. Are, are, are these rules from Latin or are these rules from English? So these, these rules are for English words because we're talking about English, um, reading of English words. There are, Latin, so let me take a step back. Latin actually uses the same alphabet as us. So when it comes to like the phonemes to graphemes, that's the same because there are other languages that don't have an alphabetic system. Their graphing system could be um, logographic, like like Mandarin, like the Chinese language. Their words are basically pictures, versus ours is made up of letters that represent sounds. So um, Latin and English, they both follow. Uh, they both are alphabetic, but. The way that they divide syllables may look a little different. The, the way that they assign the sound to the vowels may sound a little different as well. So. And did you know that there are 44 sounds, 44 phonemes in the English language that the children need to learn be, to be able to read? So beginning reading is from K through 3. By the time they get to fourth grade, instead of learning to read, we are having them read to learn. And that's where, uh, it, and even though um, common core standards, foundational reading goes up through fifth grade, once you get to fifth grade, the teachers really are not teaching you how to read. They expect you to be able to read and you're building like comprehension skills and you're building content knowledge. So when I say, you know, you're in fifth grade, you're in sixth grade and you read below reading level, it's really sad because unless there's a strong reading specialist and every school doesn't have one, I've taught I probably eight schools in the city. Um, this is what my 16th or 17th year teaching, and it's only a couple schools that actually had a reading specialist in it. So um, if they don't have that, then it's sad that they might be at a, a significant loss. So that's all very foundational. And then you get to what my favorite part is. So this is the third chapter in the book, um, well, third, fourth, and fifth. Prefix, root, and suffix. So um, I always tell the children that's my favorite thing to teach. What's a prefix? Before. It's before what? Before, before the... It's before the root word. It comes at the beginning. And if ever you forget that, well, the prefix, uh, sorry, the word prefix has a prefix, which is pre, meaning before. What other words can y'all think of that have the prefix pre? Prevent. Prevent. Prepare. Pre, did you say? Pre Prelude. Prepare. Present. Present. Mm -hmm. right. So that the reason why prefixes are important, as well as roots and suffixes, is because it helps you decode a word, but it also can help you determine the meaning of a word. If you don't know, you again, you you're not going to be able to memorize every word. You're going to encounter words.
No, it's yes. Context into the meaning? Yes, all the word parts do, but there's something in particular that the suffix tells us. It tells us the part of speech. Mm -hmm. So like, if you end a word in L-Y, like happily or slowly or gladly, that's an adverb because it's describing how something is done, right? Like my mom used to be like, wash the dishes and do it gladly, which I never did. I always hate washing the dishes. Um, if I'm running, I'm running quickly versus running slowly, right? Uh, words that end in A-T-E, eight, they can either be adjectives or they can be verbs, like hydrate, right? Um, yeah, that's what suffixes are for. So, um, again, knowing all of this really aids children in understanding words that they've never seen before. We put all this together, I can break down a word using that and the context. And so these are, there's a system of teaching uh, words and literacy. The program is called Words Their Way. It's one of my favorites. And actually my book is organized in the same sequence that their program is. And the, the, so the top tier, so they have, um, you know, letter name, word pattern, syllables, and affixes, affixes being the prefix and the suffix. The final, the final level is called word derivations, which is etymology, which is looking at root words and looking at word, where words come from. So I want to share some of my favorite etymologies with y'all because they just blew my mind when I found out this is what these words meant. So one of my favorites is disaster. Disaster. So there's a prefix in disaster. What is it? This. What does this mean? Break up, break apart. Apart, mm hmm Or it can mean not, right? It's opposition. It's a negation. Then you have the root word aster, which is Greek. What do you think? A-S-T-E-R, aster. What do you think that means? What does it sound like? like in space. Astrology, Astrology is, is connected. Something in space. What in space, though? A star. Stars, right. Okay, so this meaning bad or not or something negative and aster, disaster literally means bad star. And that is because, and this is where etymology is great because it also can um, help you understand like history and how different cultures, I guess, perceive things in history. So historically, you know, the Greeks, they looked to the stars. Not just the Greeks, it's really all people around the world look to the stars, right? And so if you look at the stars and it's a bad configuration, then you're said to have a disaster. Maybe you're, you yield a bad crop this season because the stars were not aligned for you. So, but in Latin, we have the word consider. What's the prefix for consider? Con, which means? Negation. No. Again. No. With. Say it again. With. It means with. Mm -hmm. Can you think of other words that have con, C O N, or C O N? That's con. another. Con. Conjunction. Like a conjunction. Perfect. What else? Someone said the contradiction. That prefix is actually contra, C O N T R A. So it's a little different. Continuation. Continuation is one. What did she say? Confusion. Mm -hmm. Convex. Convex. Convey. Yep. So con means with or together. And then sidder. Has anybody ever heard of sidereal? If you're into astrology, you probably heard that before. Sidereal is um, like a way of looking at astrology because there's two different, there's multiple systems, but one of the main systems is the sidereal system. And once again, we're talking about astrology, which means we're looking at stars. So consider is um, like with the stars. Okay, so it has a more positive connotation, but it's still relating back to the stars. This is from Latin, which shows us that the Romans also looked at stars. Now we know that the Greek and the Roman, looking at stars, they took that 
from Africa, right? That's why I said it's a global thing. But yes, looking at those two words, it just amazed me. We don't use those words today in that manner, but that is what they came from. Here's another one. Whenever I talk about etymology, everybody always says this to me. Oh, um, don't say somebody is nice, right? Um, why? Why do you think they say don't use the word nice? Mm -hmm. Because of the, the French origin? Mm -hmm. so, well, it's it passes through the French and then comes originally from Latin. the Latin. Mm -hmm. So tell Which us more. It means to be uh, not, uh, like, not passive, but... Uh, the exact meaning, but it's something not good. It is something not good. <laughs> um, I mean, for knowing like, like how humble it is like to be, not really not humble, but I forget. Dumb? Not, well, uh, yeah, I guess you could say that. Like, not dumb, knowing. Like, yeah. It means not knowing. It comes from the word leashin, me meaning not, and then shin. Um, it's spelled kind of like science, and we know science is knowledge. So, Nishant is not knowing, and so nice is the French, I guess, transliteration of that. So that's why a lot of people, when they try to, when they speak and they say, we want to use the origin of the word, we don't use the word nice, right? So um, that was another one that was fascinating to me. Um, the brother left, but just a moment ago, <laughs> excuse me, somebody said, yeah, and I don't use the word good morning. And so I had to have this conversation with somebody because morning, M-O-R-N-I-N-G, is a homophone of morning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. But if you look up the etymology of those two words, they actually have two completely different meanings. So, you know, I think there's a lot of talk about etymology these days and wanting to use certain words and the correct terminology, but I really encourage people do your research on the words. Don't just say, oh, because they sound the same, they must be the same. That's not necessarily the case. Actually, homophones and homographs, they, those, the two words, particularly homographs, is what's a homograph? How is it different from a homophone? Two words that spell the same, but they, they may have a different pronunciation. Mm -hmm. And they definitely have a different media, meaning they have a different, most times they have a different origin as well. So, you know, again, they look the same, they sound the same. That doesn't mean that they have the same meaning or the same origin. Live and live. Live and live. That's what we have. Or I thought it had more. And my kids do. So the thing with live and live is, I would guess that if I did the etymology, it would be similar just because they're actual meanings are very similar. Like they don't mean the exact same thing, right? Because something if something's live, that's really describing something as an adjective, and live is a verb. But they both have to do with life. So I would say those two probably have um, the same, right? But wind, like wind something up, and wind, I would not think that they have the same etymology. And then, um, in the book, so the last chapter is about word origin, and how to look up the origin of words. It's also about the history of the English language. And my favorite part of that chapter are portmanteau words. Anybody ever heard of a portmanteau word? Okay. Um, portmanteau, it is when you take two words, you put them together, but you take a little bit of each word away. So you can create a completely new word. I think the most well-known example is smog. What's smog? Smoke and fog. Smoke and fog, right? So I took the first part of smoke and the last part of fog, and I created a new word. So my favorite portmanteau word is vitamin. What do you think that's a combination of? Vital minerals. Ding, ding, ding. Yes, that's exactly what it is. A vital mineral. So those are the things that you can learn from reading etymology rules. And like I said, there are exercises in the book. So um, it's not just a passive read, but it's really designed for you to um, you know, do some thinking, do some reading, do some practice, and do some thinking. Um, I have a question. Just how did you spell Portmanteau? Portmanteau? 
Spelling B. Uh, P O R. I actually wrote it down. Uh, P O R or T M A N on T E A U. It is French. What was the word? Um, the mineral vitamin? Vi vitamin. And then the combination word? Vital mineral. Vi vital. Vital mineral is vitamin. Oh, wow. Vitamin. That's really what it is. Mm -hmm. Hangry. Hangry is another one. <laughs> Some of y'all might be hangry right now. Probably dinner time. Yeah. There's food. There's food. Oh, yeah. You're right in the right place for that. Um, so. That's really what the whole book is about. That's what I'm all about. I love language, literacy. You know, another thing that I found really fascinating in doing this research, um, spelling. I think etymology can really help you with spelling too. And that's something I don't know how much it's being taught in schools as it was when, when we probably were younger. So a lot of children come, and they're great readers, but they cannot spell orthopedic. It is really sad. Um, but, you know, when students are studying the spell for the spelling bee, they are really looking at the etymology of words. That's why you notice in the spelling bee, they'll ask questions like, what's the language of origin? It's because they're actually studying where some of these words come from. Y'all remember Akilah and the bee? Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't she studying? Like, oh, this, this, is word, this word is Greek. This word is Latin. This word is um, a Native American or indigenous. To, to this land. So um, that's another great benefit of understanding etymology. And then it's just kind of fun. I mean, I, I initially got into this, well, I actually had a mentor, but before I talk about the mentor, I specifically remember being in high school and we, uh, my teacher doing a unit on etymology. And I, I just was really fascinated with it, but I don't think I really dove deep into it until some years later, I had a mentor and um, I met him at Everlasting Life in um, Capitol Heights. They were doing like lectures once a week. And so one night I was there and I happened to mention I was a teacher and he was like, oh, well, I want to show you something. And so he showed me all the work he was doing on etymology and then he committed to meeting with me pretty much every week. Now, this is when I was not teaching full time. I was running um, a tutoring business and I was teaching at Prince George's Community College. So I had a lot more time than I do now, but he would meet with me every week for hours. I mean, we would sit in the basement of, in the bottom of Union Station and he, we would just pour over texts about language and etymology. So I really credit a lot to him um, and so he is dedicated to him and my parents, but he's the one who kind of got me on this journey. And then ever since then, I just been kind of going with it. So, um, a couple other things I mentioned, I have the social media for those who weren't here. When I said that you can follow me on Instagram and TikTok at etymology rules. And I post, um, I've been lately doing a root word of the week. And so you, Check me out and see root words. And I have like a little root word tree and I add words each day and I tell what the word means and um, I break the word down and it's prefix and it's root and suffix is, if necessary. So that's one thing. And then the other thing that's really cool is like, I love teaching children. Um, and so I have a children's show. It's called the Etymology Rule Show with me, I'm Miss B. And my sidekick is Ori who is actually my goddaughter, and um, she does the voice of Ori the cat slash teddy bear cat. It's the teddy bear cat. That's what I would best describe it as. Um, but yeah, we just talk about words and language, and we go through little adventures. And, you know, I played it for my fifth graders one day, and they were like, oh, this is so cool. And then... Um, one of them, he like quotes it every time he sees me now. Like we had a beach episode, and every time he sees me now, he's like, "We're going to the beach. We're going to the beach." Um, but yeah, it's very highly engaging. And so if you have children, 
I would encourage you to have them check out the Etymology Rules show. Yeah. On. Oh, it's on YouTube. It is on YouTube. So we just, we finished season one last year and we're getting ready to start up with season two. Um, so I definitely want to leave some time for questions. I know some people had questions throughout, but does anybody have any questions or comments or anything they'd like to share? Sure. You shared some of your favorite words with us. Do you have any other words you'd like to share? My favorite word? Uh, okay, well, I share my favorite etymologies, but my favorite word is a bad word. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because I told my principal this. Um, she's like this older white lady. She's not my principal anymore. She used to be. But I took a Latin class with her one summer. She's this older white lady, and she's like, she went, I think she went to like Harvard or Princeton or something like that. And, you know, she was just <laughs> And then we had to all go around and say our favorite word. Ooh, can I say it? I'm just making sure there are no kids in here. They should all be in bed anyway. They already know it. Uh, yeah, you ain't lying. They sure do. <laughs> I am being recorded. It's the B word. There we go. It's the B word. Yeah. Breakfast? <laughs> yes. Yes. I that, that word. Too. Yes, absolutely. OK, but let me tell you why. Um, because I think it's kind of cool how you could say oh, that word and say it in so many different ways. It has different meanings, right? You'd be like, mm, like, mm, or you know what I mean? So I told her that, and she got a kick out of that. Actually, I think she was like, I get it. And that's a linguistic concept. Like, it's not just something that is for fun and games, but it's a linguistic concept that, like, the way you say something also conveys its meaning. So. Yes, thank you for that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so that kind of goes into my question. How, how does this play with like, how us as black people in America develop our slangs and idioms uh, and different stuff like that? And even the different dialects of different languages around the world and stuff. How mm -hmm. does that play into that? Well, I think when it comes to like slang, I mean, you could look at the etymology of slang too. Right? I think it's less well-known, though, to be honest. And that's something where, well, that's why we need more black linguists. Because, you know, did you know that there are no linguistic doctoral programs at any HBCUs in the nation? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But see, that's something that we, we if, if, if these things were, if these programs were at our schools, just think about what kind of research that would be done. So for an, another example, just to talk about it, my um, family is from South Carolina, and they derive from the Gullah Geechee, and that's a whole dialect, right? And there's been a lot of shame for some people around speaking in that dialect because they were told it's like backwards. But think about if people were to approach that from a scholarly perspective and show that it's actually a Creole not a backwards language at all. It's actually a Creole, not too different from Caribbean Creoles or Creoles from Africa. And you can trace certain ways that things are said in Gullah to West African languages. So um, to answer your question, etymology does play a role in understanding vernacular. However, I don't think that there's um, a significant body of research uh, because there's not been enough resources put towards it. I think that people do do research, not saying that there's not research on it, but I just don't think people put, there's enough resources put towards that. So. And I wish there was, you know, one project I would love to do is just do a dictionary of um, the etymology of different black language or black language, black, black vernacular terms. You know, um, one thing I find is really funny you know, when, and this especially, well, we're in D.C., so D.C. and, and below, and th south of us might say, oh, I'm finna do this, right? Like, I have, you know, my school has a lot of white people, and they be like, oh, I'm finna do this, and I'm like, do you know what that, like, what that mean, right? I'm, it's like, I'm fitting to do this. Right? We don't say that in the way that we speak, oh, I'm going to do this. But they didn't know that at all. That's why etymology 
um, our vernacular is important. Because people out here just saying stuff and don't really understand or respect where it comes from. Well, I'm, I'm originally from New York, and I moved to the South when I was young. So when I got there, a lot of people were saying fitna and fixing. I'm fixing it. Mm -hmm. like, so it was like a similar thing, and it really felt like a completely different language. Like, what are they, what are they doing? Are we oh, about to do something? Um, but you know, it, it, the etymology, I guess, is sort of it varies too. I, I, I'm sure you say like regionally, and it can feel like this foreign language. But I think my question is sort of about how it evolved. So you know, like we were talking earlier about how you hear the word is <laughs> like you know, I think that's too short to favorite word too. <laughs> but so how does you know at one point, nice for example, we were talking about earlier, that was a negative word, you know, now we say it in a positive, you know, we usually say it in a nice person. Where does this evolution of, of language come from? How, where did nice come from being dull and ignorant? Or is it just that this society sort of favors people who are dull and, you know, mm -hmm. you're nice, you, you follow and do what we want you to do, you're a nice person, come, come with me, nice person. Yeah, I mean, I think you kind of just said it. So, you know, language doesn't change <clears throat> systematically, right? It's, it's based on the culture. It's based on the times. So I think you said it perfectly. Nice meant you were ignorant. But then if you're ignorant, that means you're kind of sweet, right? Agreeable. And, and that makes you agreeable, which then at the end of the day makes you somebody that is likable. Mm -hmm. But the problem is we've divorced it, the word completely from its origin. Right? So... Yeah, it's, I, I think the other cool thing about etymology is that it can tell the story of a word over time. And like one cool project that I have my students do is just tell the story of this word. Tell me what this word was at the beginning, at its middle stage, because most words come through, they, either, they when they come into English, if they come from Latin, they come through the French, right? And then they come into English. So tell me the story. What was it in Latin? What was it through the, the French? And then what is it today? What was the means? And how did it change? And why did it change? Is that why we have so many French cognates? Yes. <laughs> that makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you think about also historically speaking, um, you had the French in England. And so you had Old English. And then Middle English is really where you're blending Old English and French, and then over time you get modern English, which is where you get more of that the Latin and the Greek coming into play. But again, all that history is in my wonderful book, so I hope you guys get a chance to check it out. Here it is once again. If you weren't here, at Knowledge Rules Got the Basics. Um, it's my baby. <laughs> all right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that's kind of subjective. However, I, I mean, it, for us or in general, because I think if you were born into a language, then that's like naturally easy for you to learn. English is actually hard for a lot of people to learn who don't speak um, our language because we have so many rules. But when you talk about like written languages, you a lot of the Asian languages are probably the most difficult to learn for us because we have a completely different alphabetic system. So they're not sounding out words because as I said earlier, their words are pictures. So I guess it just depends on what language you're speaking. Um, that determines what language would be harder for you to learn. If I grew up speaking Korean, then learning Mandarin probably would not be as difficult for me as if I grew up speaking English. So do you know the linguistic joke? Um, I'm sure you're going to tell me. OK, if you know if you know three or more languages, you're multilingual. If you know two languages, you're bilingual. If you know one language, you're an American. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> it's true. It's very true. Um, you know, we often look at second language acquisition from a space of you speak another language and you need to learn English. However, we should start 
thinking of it as we speak English and we need to learn other languages. Because we're like the only ones. Everyone else in the world is learning multiple languages, including English. Um, but when you speak the lingua franca, you I guess you, you don't believe you need to learn other languages because your language is the language everybody in the world is trying to learn. And that's because our dollar is supreme at this point anyway. You know, that is maybe not for much longer, right? Um, a lot of people are trying to learn other languages like Mandarin. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, um, great joke. It's very accurate. So you said, pardon me, you said early that you didn't feel like, you know, the evolution of language is um, uh, institutional, but it's more like a cultural. Is that Yes. Well, the, the evolution of how words change. I saw it, it, it would, the world currently being uh, Amer English centered and everyone learned. So that would make me feel like even when you go to certain countries, like some of our brand, they don't, they'll say, you know, they'll say Kleenex instead of tissue or band aid. Mm -hmm. They still use American words. Like, so um, our America, the institution is like affecting, you know, language. My question is if, if, if it is like an institutional thing, is it possible that some of these changes? Uh, were um, some of the way the words we use and the way we use them were intentionally implanted to sort of you know create a, you know energetic shift the way you, if, that, if that makes sense no that makes I'm sense I'm thinking like spiritually like vibration we take certain words we talk about mourning you said that early like the roots are different but even though they're hom homonyms <laughs> even though they're homonyms do they evoke a same energy is it still centered around if that, I don't know. I think it's mm, I'm not sure I think that for mourning per se, but I'll tell you one that people say a lot that I do think about, even though I say it all the time, um, is the word kid. Y'all know kid is like a baby goat, right? And then we use the word kid, particularly when we're talking about children, we're not trying to hurt them around. We're like, come on, get the kid. Um, so I think that may have that aspect to it, but I think my belief about the spiritual energy behind words is like, it's what you bring behind it. So it's just kind of like this, right? Mm -hmm. Like what energy am I bringing to using that word? Because when I say it, that doesn't mean I've now cursed you as a female dog. Like you'd be my best friend. I'd be like, eh, did, you yeah. did you hear what he said? I, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So like that doesn't now create discord between us per se. Um, so I think we, our energy is greater than the words that we speak. We have that power. Yes? Have you done any research on the um, cognitive development of the brain based on the linguistic capacity or the, the types of languages people learn from birth? Because mm -hmm. I've read that like in the early 1900s, late 1800s, <clears throat> The reason that Einstein and all those scientists in Germany uh, developed uh, quantum mechanics and relativity is because that German is a very precise language and that to say something in German has a very definite meaning. In fact, they went through, what, 20, 30 years ago, they created a whole new language, German language, because they, they did stuff. And they said that, that to learn German cognitively develops your brain to have very fine precision, whereas that didn't that doesn't exist in the United States. In fact, I've read that in English in the United States, particularly, the purpose of English is to confuse and to 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 uh, uh, discombobulate. It's not it's not for precision. English is not used for precision. It's used exactly for the opposite of precision. And in fact, I also read that that the script for, for Mandarin and Cantonese is the same script. But it's pronounced differently because they have a different cultural orientation. And the same thing for Korean. It's the same script. You could write it in the same thing, but it's, you know, Korean, Cantonese, and Mandarin are totally different languages, but they all share the same script. Mm -hmm. But because it's 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 it has to do with the cognitive um, um, evolution in the brain of how you, like you said, pictograms versus versus 
phonics. It's a, it's a different way of, it's a different epistemology. It's a different way of how you know things. Um, so there's a theory that existed like uh, over a hundred years ago called the safer works theory. And it just speaks, it speaks on just that, like different languages, um, I guess, have a certain ego, different cognitive functioning, or like a language can impact how you, how your brain functions. Um, but that theory has since been debunked by linguists because, see, when you talk about cognition, that would mean that like you have the brain capacity to do something that somebody else doesn't have. And so a language cannot give you a brain capacity. I think I might agree with you in terms of like the level of precision, but that has nothing to do with the actual functioning of the brain. No, that's not how I meant it. That's, that's not, not how cognition. I, that's not, no, well, cognition is your capacity to develop. And what, what, what I've read is that they say some languages are more natural in helping develop aspects of the brain that go undeveloped using other other concepts, other con co other other constructs of conceptualization. And I know this to be a fact for math because because I do math and 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 like with music. Uh, math and music are the same thing. All it is frequencies, all you're doing is, is but it's very precise because most people don't learn the language of music and math. So they, they don't know how to use the brain to 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 think mathematically on music. Well, some languages are more tonal than others, so then that speaks to um, that aspect of what you're referring to. But at the end of the day, if you can understand it, it may take more words to be able to get there, but if you can understand it just like somebody else can understand it, then you have the same cognitive ability. It's just the language allows us to access that information more easily in one language than another because perhaps it's more precise to that particular content or subject area. We're going to take one last question. I think this has a question right here. Yes. <laughs> um, you shared a lot of like foundational information to language to be able to understand it, speak it, write it, comprehend it. How does that either stay the same or shift if I'm dyslexic or I use ASL? Okay. So for dyslexia, dyslexia is a phonological processing disorder, which means that you have difficulty basically decoding words. But it's also because you have difficulty holding all that information. Remember all that, like the first half of what we talked about was breaking down words. And that's a lot of information. You have to use your working memory to be able to apply that and read a word. So people who are dyslexic have trouble holding all that in and then being able to sound out words. Um, and I would say they need more drill in practice in the information that we talked about with the phonemes, graphemes, et cetera. Um, with ASL, you know, because they're not because they're not hearing, um, then it, it it's a completely different system of utilizing language. Because we're talking about sounds and symbols, they're really just using symbols. But it's interesting because I asked somebody, this would be an interesting topic of study, but how does somebody who is deaf learn how to read if our words are phonetic? Mm -hmm. right? Do they have to memorize every single word? Because again, that's very difficult. And I learned from um, somebody who is in the deaf community who is a sign language interpreter that a lot of people who are deaf have difficulty reading mm -hmm. probably for that very reason. Mm -hmm. So this was great. Yeah. Oh, thank yeah, you thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to get the book from Brittany, uh, please come to her and she will give you the book. And yeah, thank, thank you so much thank for organizing it. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for having me. For sure. Thank you. I feel like I learned.